uh, let's get started. Um, this is, as SK just said, the outline that we're going to follow today. It's two hours with a few breaks in between. I talk very fast, so I apologize for that. You can add your questions at any time, and uh, we'll get to them with, I, I hope, ample time for Q&A uh, and uh, just after the breaks. Uh, you can see the outline here. We're going to cover in the first part the IBC Chapter 34. Then we'll, after the break, we'll, we'll transition into the IEBC and do a comparison of the two codes. And then in the last section, we'll talk about some case studies and some examples of where things are going right and where things are going wrong with the code. Uh, a couple of points, uh, you if you have the 2012 IBC or IEBC, it might be useful to, help, to follow along with that. When I refer to things, then you can look at directly at the text on your own and have your, the slides there separate. Uh, and uh, let's see, well, I've forgotten the other thing. So let's uh, move forward. So on existing buildings, uh, the main point I want to say in this very intro short introductory portion is that the pr code provisions for existing buildings are different from the provisions for new construction. When you're doing new construction, you are starting with a blank slate and you're dealing with one building at a time. In the existing building world, even though we take it one project at a time, really we're trying to do different things. We're re this existing building provisions represent public policy in a little bit different way than the new code does. We are dealing with uh, not a blank slate, um, a jurisdiction that has a lot of relatively new buildings, may have different priorities than old ones. Meanwhile, how we regulate the existing building stock in a city or a small town has a lot to do with things about preserving the history, or it's related to the planning, or it's related to uh, where we want to emphasize new growth or revitalization in the city. So a lot of those things come into play when local jurisdictions are creating policy for existing buildings, they are different from new buildings. And what that means is that we give some, uh, a little bit of different philosophy when we're working with existing buildings. We can't just say, you will do this the way we can with new buildings. We have to be a little more uh, cognizant of what the existing conditions are. So for example, just because the code has changed in say the detailing requirements for boundary elements and concrete shear walls, that doesn't automatically make any older building obsolete. We want to make sure that the provisions don't automatically do that. At the same time, we can't assume some things that we would normally assume for new buildings. So we have to be aware of the fact that uh, quality control might not have been very good when that building was built or that things deteriorate over time. But in the end, the questions really uh, are, are different. It's not a matter of so much of the details for any particular building. It's the philosophical question. And the main question that the existing building code provisions try to answer is this. When does it become necessary to upgrade the existing building? Structurally, that is the primary question that we're going to ask, and you'll see it come up over and over again in the next hour and a half, two hours. <clears throat> so to ask that question, when must the existing building be upgraded? That is not a new question, but a little bit of history here. Before 1980, there was some very rough ideas of when that should happen. And the only provisions available were the provisions for new buildings. So really the only question was, when does an existing building have to meet the new building provisions? So there were a few rules in the code. They were well, well, they were well intentioned, but they didn't work well. Uh, because there were these very bright lines, they ended up having the effect of discouraging work in existing buildings. So around 1980, uh, it was when HUD, especially the House, Department of Housing and Urban Development at the federal level, said this isn't working for us. It's discouraging the renovation of housing. So we're going to change this. Uh, and they ended up removing some of those old triggers from the building code. And that's the way it stayed for about a decade. Meanwhile, uh, in the 1990s, uh, they were working on an alternative to this. And this eventually became the IEBC. We'll talk about that a little bit later. <clears throat> At the same time, uh, there were two major earthquakes uh, in California in 1989, Loma Prieta, and in 1994, Northridge, and those had the effect of really spurring a lot of thinking on existing building side with a particular uh, emphasis on seismic, which is why so many of the existing building provisions has something to do with earthquake. I think we're seeing that change now a little bit as the IEBC especially gets adopted around the country. And as uh, uh, jurisdictions begin to think about uh, wind and snow and other extreme conditions, and also about just the, the general renovation of their building stock. 
All this came together finally around 2003 in the first edition of the IEBC. The IBC, if you remember, was already was it was still pretty new as a replacement for the regional uh, building codes. But uh, even later, the 2003 IEBC came along. It was not really adopted very much uh, at, in the first couple of cycles, which makes sense because it was new. But uh, by now, it's been adopted widely. So now we are looking, when we talk about the I codes family for existing buildings, three main codes: the IBC, the IEBC.